lock and the role of this nuclear submarine will dramatically change. The lock is to become enemy-occupied territory, and the sub on another stretch of water completely will be smuggling in the good guys who are on a mission to destroy a nuclear research base. And the good guys, they're the teams competing in the final of combat. There's a first prize of £5,000 and an ITV combat trophy awaiting the winning side. And the sides in that final are the Scots Guards against the Parachute Regiment. Yes, one old regiment and one new. We, the Scots Guards, were formed in 1642. Waterloo's among our battle honors. We remember the heroic defense of Hougamont Farm. Later, the Crimean War. At Alma, we won four of the first VCs awarded. We, the Paras, began in World War II. The Bruneval Raid, our first classic operation. Like the Scots Guards, we fought the North African campaign. It would be the same in the Normandy landings. At Arnhem, 700 Paras made it to the bridge. A hundred returned. More recently, both our regiments fought in the Falklands, again with a lot of distinction, a lot of honor. The Prince of Wales is our Colonel in Chief, and the Queen is ours. Pomp and ceremony, spit and polish, aye, of course. But that's only a part of it. Just recently, for instance, we've done a tour of Belize. Mighty different from the parade ground. Training in jungle warfare, protecting and helping the locals. And of course, training for combat, like the Paras. Training. Till a recruit conquers stuff like this, he can't call himself a para. So, ancient and modern, but with equal pride. Both trained to win. The finalists in combat. So, now meet the men who represent us. And first, the Scots Guards. Lieutenant Alexander Carey, 26, single, from London. Colour Sergeant Ian Gwynn, 29, married, from Flynn Stirling. That's out, Glenn Scott, 27, single, from Portsmouth. Garden Steve McGowan, 21, from Shildon, County Durham. Also known as Mongo. I'm Chris Kemp, Lieutenant. Age 24, single, and come from Stamford Links. So I'm Bob Parry, 27 years old, I'm married, and come from Southampton. Lance Corporal John Bearcroft, I'm single, I'm 21 years old, I'm from Biddleton Station in Northumberland. Private John Kernigan is 26, single, and live in Scotland. And the Parachute Regiment will begin this final. Now the Paras have been favourites right from the start. You go into the final as favourites, favourites sometimes fall. Mm. Let's wait and see her. You'll be in there trying. And you're all prepared and all ready. We're ready. Yeah. And the Paras can win it, you think? We can win it. Here's the plot. The Paras, and they'll be closely followed by the Scots Guards, have been dropped into this country. And this whole area has been overrun by enemy forces. Their ultimate mission is to capture a nuclear base. The only problem is that base is over 100 miles away. Well, they reckon that the first 50 miles can be done on rough tracks. And the local partisans have done them a couple of favors, like a couple of Land Rovers. Competitively, this first trek is expressed in the form of a rally. And it takes place in the hills behind me. Now, of course, it's up against the clock, and there are various checkpoints along the way. Also remember, this is hostile territory, so there could be a few surprises. Are you ready? The Paras, then, navigating their way to the lock. The first phase of this long trek. Now, the winners of combat will almost certainly be the team who get to the base the quicker. That's only part of it. They'll need all their skills. They'll get time penalties for every fault or failure. Private John Kernahan drives vehicle number one, with Lieutenant Chris Kemp navigating. Lance Corporal John Baycroft, the Northumberland lad, he drives car number two with Sergeant Bob Parry. The route unmarked. It's all down to grid information and map reading. The 
first near disaster and coming up the first problem. decided it wasn't a booby trap, merely a natural obstacle, and just went for it, nine miles already. Finding the checkpoints, going well for time. Got him. Got him. And every checkpoint has a marker showing a letter. The teams have to note it as proof that they've been there. for John Baycroft. Meantime, the Scots are ready to start. Already thinking ahead to an all-night trek on foot. So how are you feeling? OK. Yeah? Yeah, quite confident, I think. Do you actually, Alex, get nervous before uh, something like this? Well, I have throughout the competition, before each event, I've got very nervous, yes. I didn't think I was going to be so nervous before this one. But, uh, I, but I, yes, I am. And I think the worst bit is this... Rucksack you have to cart around, Alex. I mean, uh, uh, you get that on your back, let alone cart it around for two days. Uh, well, I mean, we help each other with the burdens. After a while, it's, a, it's just a matter of helping each other. They're too heavy to just put on yourself. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, looking ahead, could be the low point for you? If at any stage our uh, navigation should go amiss, then obviously that doesn't help the morale factor. So, yeah. but apart from that, uh, if everything goes well, then the morale keep up. It's only if. We make mistakes. It must so really be that we can see three o'clock in the morning syndrome well, that, that gets to you. Then. It all depends what's happened before. If everything's gone to, according to plan, and the plan for us is to go nice and steady and keep it going, just keep it ticking over really till till tomorrow morning. Then we'll go into top gear. And if it's gone according to plan, then three o'clock in the morning will be fine. If we've had a a, a, mis a big mistake, mm. which is obviously going to affect the morale, then then sure. it's going to be a little bit harder for us. Control Marshal One. Junction with new road. So the grid reference is being worked out. Lieutenant Alex Carey will drive one car with Ian Gwynne navigating. Glenn Scott the other with Mongo or Magoo McGowan. Right, you ready to start off? We're heading, we're going back in that way. Okay. Junction with the new road, there's a, there's a thing. The clock's already started, but obviously no point in rushing the map reading bit then finding you've lost your way. Well, that's exactly what they've done right at the start. Wrong direction, two minutes lost. Well, they've gone a mile and a quarter and they're still in trouble. Obviously something wrong, only one thing for it, back to where they came from and start all over again. Worst possible beginning to this final for the Scots. That's their progress, or rather lack of it so far. Two full starts already, now another. And the sum total of all that toing and froing is that they've lost 11 minutes. They've now realised their mistake. They've been confusing the first checkpoint references with those for the start. I couldn't understand why they couldn't find a marker on their way at last. That's ten and a half minutes slower than the Paris to this point, and they're only 18 minutes into the competition. Where the Paris road roughshod, the Scots guards are cautious. All right, the pin. Right, this is that one there. I'll go straight over. No, don't go that pin. Take it out then. Okay. 
and that's nearly another minute and a half slower. Well, that was certainly a very shaky start there for the Scots guards. I've actually come along to the next checkpoint. Hopefully they'll be making up some time, should be here shortly. Fingers crossed they've got their act together now. Yeah. 37 minutes, 11 minutes slower than the Paras. So, the guards struggle. The paras are going fine. Well, that's the paras through. What they don't know, there's a dead end up there. Been spotted by the enemy, and they've blocked the way back. Interesting. Luckily for them, again, there wasn't a booby trap. No problems then, and no penalties. John Baycroft again. I'd hate to think what could have happened there. It's a sheer drop. The others are going to have to tow it out. And for the first time, it's the Paras who are in trouble. Well, here come the Scots guards now at a cracking pace. The all-important question, have they made up any of that lost time? <laughs> An hour and 20 minutes gone, 10 minutes, not 11, between them now. Sergeant Glenn Scott. He and the other Scots still making up time. Now over to the Paras. Right down on the right side. Harder! Every minute they take now, of course, is a minute gained by the Scots guards behind them. And again, the Scots guards typically methodical. No crashing through for them. Every log manhandled. Another five minutes gone. And the Scots guards, at this moment, four minutes faster. Try and lift that rock, Try and lift it with the side of Twenty terrible minutes for the Paris. And the Scots Guards now with a nine minute advantage. An hour and fifty minutes on the road. Well, another shock for our two drivers. Barricades. More important, enemy machine gun. Looks like an ambush. No penalties. They'll just have to find another way. 
Well, the Padders have encountered another problem, a flat tire. They're gonna have to change the wheel. And the only thing they've got to help them is a wheel brace. Roll it in a bit more. Roll the wedge in a bit more. That'll move. That'll move. Fair enough. I need some more weight here. Okay. Chris Kim. I need more weight. I need more weight. I more weight. I need more weight. John Kernahan. <laughs> Bob Paddy and John Bancroft. Just for a bit longer. Okay, 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 put it in. Okay. Okay, get the kit away then. And behind them, the Scots guards, 15 minutes faster. Alex Carey in the leading vehicle. Behind him, Glenn Scott. Both vehicles going well. Or are they? David, but thankfully, all four lads seem to be up and running and OK. What's going to happen now? Well, they were extremely lucky. Yeah. Uh, Garsman McGowan, I think, has bashed his legs. Um, he probably knocked his head. Mm. So what I'm going to do is to take him out of the competition now and get him back to see a doctor. They penalise themselves, of course, in the time that they take to pull the vehicle out. Right. But it's not the end. I mean, they can still get on with three people. Yes. It's just much more difficult. It really is going to be a case of teamwork now. Absolutely. Meanwhile, another problem coming up for the Paris. And it's a 10 minute penalty. That delayed booby trap explosion would have taken out the second vehicle. It seems the Paris have come to a dead end. We'll find out more about that in a minute. But for them, it seems the driving phase is over. Two hours, 30 minutes, 37 seconds, including that 10 minute penalty. But what's the position with the Scots Guards now? And how's Magoo McGowan? Well, the good news, of course, is that Magoo is all right. He's badly shaken and bruised, but nothing worse than that. The bad news, well, the team can't tow this vehicle up the hill, so they're down now to one vehicle and just three men. But they're going to fight on, and all is not yet lost. They're 26 minutes slower than the Paras, penalties excluded. But with what's to come in this final, well, that may be nothing. But this won't help. Their turn for the flat tyre. could really feel the loss of their core command. In fact, the way they're actually going about changing this tire is textbook stuff. It's the only way to do it with just the three of them. I've got to loosen them off. As soon as you've done that, I need the wheel brakes again. Seven minutes 30, that's nearly double the time taken by the four paras. You've been met by a friendly agent at the point where the road ran out. Going up to, uh, I believe, to Pole Farm, yes. yeah? Yeah. Yeah, well, what's happened is, uh, as you can see, there's been a landslide, so we're going to change you on. You're going to have to leave your vehicles here and hide up your vehicles at this location, because you can't go back, because the enemy forces are now coming from, from the north down to the south, and then you're going to go on foot through a series of locations on up through to Pole Farm. And these locations, we've uh, wrecked them. And we, you know, from our friendly uh, partisans around the back end of it, and they feel that is the best route for you to take. Well, there's only one thing for it. They've got to walk, walk, walk. To the lock, where partisans should be waiting for them to guide them across the water to the next stage of the trek, which is towards the nuclear research base. And when they make that trek, 
It's going to be with full kit and weapons, weighing over a hundred pounds per man. Fourteen hundred hours, thirty-five miles or more just to the lock. But that's as the crow flies, and the nuclear base is a long, long way the other side. And treacherous terrain all the way. Bob Parry the sergeant, leading the way. A real force for the Paras throughout this series of combat. Chris Kemp, the lieutenant. John Baycroft, the Lance Corporal, and John Kernahan, the Private. Their first main objective still 10 miles away. Steeples Mountain, 1,265 feet. Three Scots Guards still on phase one. We're coming to the booby trap logs. No time for caution now, they risk it. And no penalty, they get away with it. No second vehicle there to be blown up. Alex Carey at the wheel. It was Scott's Land Rover that crashed and injured Magoo. The end of the road, 2.59.52. An hour and 30 of penalties. Total, 4.29.52. That huge penalty imposed for losing one vehicle and one man. So that's the end of the driving phase. They're about to start their long trek. It's 35 miles through the night. Despite the problems, though, that the Scots guards have so far encountered, they're actually not doing too badly at all. Two hours behind the Paras, but that could still easily be turned round with the best part of a day and a half to come. Technique here from the Paras. They wore their packs till halfway down. The Scots using ropes to lower everything. Possibly safer, certainly much slower. Scots guards slog on. Ahead of them, the Paras are making heavy weather of finding one of the checkpoints. What they're looking for is the waterfall checkpoint on the way up to Steeples Mountain. And what they don't realise is that they've gone past it, so they have to come back. Then they miss the gully leading up to Steeples and come up another route. A very difficult climb up to the checkpoint. That's around 10 miles they've done. They might have a few brief rests, but there'll be no sleep for them lads tonight.
By the time they reach the checkpoint, their errors have cost them 20 minutes. It's time for a quick cuppa and to plan the next move. What we could do, you know, is follow the stream all the way down, you know? That's what I'm thinking of doing. But uh, the checkpoint looks like it's the other side of the river, so we're going to figure out how long we're going to Tired? Well, obviously. But morale is still high, fortified by strong tea and close teamwork. You're right, John. It's late evening now. The Scots are approaching the same point where the Paris slipped up. They've been going well. Their march up to the last point was 10 minutes faster than the Paris. But now they too make mistakes. They're bearing. We can't go up there. We can, we can go up here, can't we? Yeah. Rather like the Paris, they have to double back before slogging on up to steeples. But it's not crucial. Well, it's getting really dark now, the night's setting in. They're still doing well, they've still got a chance. 21, 30 hours at Steeples and another setback. They've hidden their kit down below to ease the climb, so now they can't take the straight line to the next checkpoint. They have to go down, then across. Well, I must say, I don't envy either of the teams now. Ahead of them, they've got a long night. It's getting cold, the wind's come up. Will they make it? The terrain, the finalists of combat are having to navigate and conquer. Difficult by day, horrendous for them by night. That's been their route, a brief layup in the small hours, and now in daylight, down to the beach where a boat is waiting to ferry them five miles down and across the lock for the next and final stage of their trek to destroy their nuclear research base. Well, the Paris looks to have had a long, hard struggle, but it's a tribute to their strength, training and fitness that they've managed to get through it. Also, the Scots guards are down there somewhere behind them, and they've got it all to go through. Paras, well, they're tired out. Their feet are blistered, but they're still going fast. They're nearly at the lock. Well, this is probably the beach they're going to choose for their rendezvous. You know the scenario. They have to make radio contact, which they'll choose to do, I should imagine, in the trees over there. They make radio contact with a friendly partisan. He's the man who's going to provide the boat to get them across the lock. And they've now been marching for nearly 16 hours. Oscar 42 Alpha, this is Oscar 1 1. Eagle's Claw. I say again, Eagle's Claw. Over. So perfect. several miles to go one more mountain to cross and this is the area where the enemy are reported to be about in large numbers so the paras are going to need all their military skills now their first task here was to rendezvous with an agent 
who should be leading them to the equipment they'll be needing when they reach the lake. Well, as you can see, I'm here by the water, and the Paras have still got to cross this water. They're somewhere in the hills, still trekking to get here. And the latest intelligence that we have is that there's only two of the Paras turned up to meet the agent. Now, unless all four turn up, it's an hour's penalty. Well, it's cost them 30 minutes anyway. They've been on the march over 18 hours now. Chris Kemp had decided to leave two men down below with the kit, while he and the other lad found the agent. The agent insisted on seeing all four, so they had to go all the way down and up again. Now the agent will talk. Last night there was a parachute drop, and there's two drops. One, a good reference A, one at B. Uh, the equipment in the drops actually help you in there. The paras are gradually getting nearer their target. The Scots guards are back at the beach, reflecting on the night's march. It was, uh, the mist came down uh, round about uh, 10 o'clock up in the hills, so it made navigation that much more difficult. Yeah. And one of the points was an actual trig point, which is not that big uh, when you can't see two feet in front of you. Yeah. And it, uh, it was pretty windy. So the night was a little bit uncomfortable, but in the end, uh, we still made the checkpoints, and we think we did a, a reasonable time. Hello, Oscar, 4-2 Alpha, Oscar, 1-2. Eagles claw over. 1300 hours on the second day. So they're off across the lot. The next task for them is to find two parachutes. Now, those parachutes will have equipment attached to them, and they need that equipment to help them complete their mission. Same as the paras, of course. They've already found their parachutes across the lake, and they're now creeping their way towards the nuclear research base. First team there will try to destroy it. The Scots guards, though, haven't yet found their parachutes. Behind me, you can see the first one. There's a green bag attached to it. In that bag is a little rubber dinghy. They're going to need that dinghy to cross a lake to get to the second parachute, which is blown a long way off course. What are you doing? She's going to check see the pumps in that. Well, I mean, what are you going to do if they're not there? Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's not a level of water. I'll take the local service station. The alternative is we can blow it up here. No, we'll take it with this survey. Right, I'm only the patrol commander. The strain beginning to show, perhaps, as the three surviving Scots continue their trek, leaving their packs behind as they suss out their next moves, then having, of course, to return for them. The result, more time lost. It's now very hot indeed, and although this lake may look refreshing and inviting and picturesque, I can tell you it's absolutely freezing. And this is the next obstacle for the Scots guards. The kit in the boat. It's interesting to ponder about these chaps and wonder what, say, Colour Sergeant Ian Gwynne would be doing at this moment if he'd remained a civilian. It's hard to say. I definitely wasn't uh, heading anywhere as such, so it's, it's really hard to say. But what the Army has done for me, or the Scots Guards more specifically, is uh, it's, it's given me a purpose in life. It's mm. given me a job that uh, I got a lot of job satisfaction out of. And uh, I've really met a lot of people that. Uh, I, I could say I, I would uh, trust my life to them. Nearly 25 hours now on the march. Just time to dry their things a bit. The water, in fact, going to make their feet feel even worse. Then on again towards the next objective. Well, they were catching up on the paras, but time now beginning to run out on them as they reach that next objective, the second parachute. 26 hours, six minutes now since they finished the drive. Alex Carey looking at his watch as Glenn Scott takes charge of the new equipment, an 84 anti-tank weapon. Unfortunately for them, though, the Paris looked like beating them to the chance of using it. The Paris
Paras indeed have reached their target. The area surrounding it where they'll meet their final agent. It's taken them, including that minor penalty, 24 hours, 33 minutes, 55 seconds. A really gritty, typically professional performance. And the Scots guards can't possibly match that. The time of these three survivors in the final of combat, a truly courageous effort after that massive penalty incurred by their crash, 31 hours, 20 minutes, nine. The march is over, but combat isn't. Now for the attack, then escape by helicopter. Chris Kemp, the agent, more about him in a moment, and the abandoned building they've come to destroy. The Paras are now nearing their target. It's the nuclear research station. And at this moment, they're meeting with the professor, who not only has inside information for them, he has a specialized piece of equipment. It's a grappling launcher, and that will help them complete their mission. ready. In 30 minutes, the base should blow. Well, the Paras have set the charges, and they're off to be picked up by the helicopter. But there's a major problem. Between here and there, enemy patrol. And in that patrol, two armoured vehicles, and also infantry targets. OK, we're all listening in. The battle picture is that there's no, we have to make our way towards the, um, the bunker grenade bunker in order to bring in a helicopter. We know there's a, a patrol, a, a mobile patrol to our front, and we also know that there's a platoon minus strength infantry support for those vehicles. The other factor we know is the fact that in the bunker there is um, an enemy OP consisting of two men dug in. Uh, we have to clear that before we can bring in the helicopters. First, then, the vehicles. Stand by. A miss first time with the 84. Stand by. M kill. That's a shot that would have immobilized the vehicle. Kemp and Parry, watch out. Kernahan reloads. Baycroft will aim at the other vehicle. Another immobilization. First, you two cover, okay? Gradually working their way up towards the enemy bunker. Baycroft with the machine gun, the light support weapon. Just going that left side is often. Parry, who was a sniper in the Falklands. Oh, 
So the targets and the simulated enemy fire remind us that, thankfully, this isn't war. It's an army competition, Combat 89. All sorts of things being tested in this final phase. Field craft, tactics, marksmanship, command and control, teamwork, and especially how all those skills can be performed in a state of prodigious fatigue after more than 25 hours of driving, climbing, swimming and marching. The paddlers obviously feel that fatigue. For instance, they move a bit too slowly in view of the need for a quick getaway. But despite all that, their spotting of targets remains as good as ever. And this is still part of the competition, of course. OK, move now. Time bonuses for good performance. For the paras, three hits on the armoured cars and only one infantry target missed. That means five minutes twelve off their drive and march time. And the Scots Guards, without Magoo, without his light support weapon, with a strong crosswind blowing up, but most of all through sheer fatigue, they too understandably reveal shortcomings in this final phase. Oh, tell you yep, you're all right. Stand by. Keep it in. Up, up. No hits on the cars, only three on the infantry targets. No bonuses, penalties for misses instead. The final result of combat. The Paras have beaten the Scots Guards by a margin, expressed in time of just under seven hours. And still the enemy bunker to knock out, still the getaway by helicopter. Good And still the base to go up. Oscar 1-1. One, one. Confirm uh, pickup at grid six tango. Bravo golf, whiskey bravo, Charlie, Oscar. In two minutes, over. Roger, Good night! Oscar one one, moving now. Confirm color of smoke on the ground. Out. enemy mortar position half a mile distant has opened up on them. Help arrives in the form of air support. The mortar position is destroyed. The escape is almost complete. Now only one question's left. Will the nuclear research base blow? accomplished, the Paris safely away, the winners of Combat 89. And to present the awards now, a man who himself has had first-hand experience of combat, Simon Weston. Hello. Simon, you've been watching the development of the teams over the weeks. What have your impressions been? The effort the boys have put in has been extremely hard, very, very professional. Um, nothing but admiration for all of the boys who took part, especially the B teams who pushed the boys so hard for the actual A-team places. What has been amazing, what has really come through strongly, is the motivation and the teamwork. Would you say that that's a, a common characteristic of every regiment? Teamwork then is essential within the forces. Um, and when, you try, when you're doing something as hard as the lads have done, um, I think you, it'll speak for itself. Oh, the cold, the pain, and the, the sheer agony of looking for more oxygen in the lungs. Um, I think what, what the lads have achieved is just absolutely superb. 
You've recently won an award yourself as Motivator of the Year, which is talking again about those, those same qualities of, of teamwork and motivation. What are you trying to achieve? Basically, we just want um, young people from the inner cities to realise their full potential by realising the needs of their own community, the people within their own community, because we believe that at the end of the day, it's them who will change the problems and not fancy buildings and such. Right. Well, talking of realising full potential, we've certainly seen that with the two teams who are going to now be presented with their awards. Emlyn. Well, thanks, Annika. And I have here a cheque for £5,000, which the Paras will donate to charity. And also, they'll be allowed to keep a replica of this winning trophy. So, Simon, if you present that to the winning team officer, Chris Kemp. Supreme. Thanks. Sergeant Bob Parry. Thank you. Thanks, Well done, Bob. Thank you. Corporal John Baycroft. Thank you. John. Well done. Private John Kernahan. John. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Well done. Cheers. John, if you'd <coughs> accept the winning trophy on behalf of the rest of the lads. Supreme. Cheers. Runners up, the Scots Guards receiving their trophies. Guardsman Stephen McGowan. Lance Sergeant Glenn Scott. Colour Sergeant Ian Gwynn. Cheers, Simon. And Lieutenant Alexander Carey. Thanks very much. it's good to see you back with the team. Cheers. Feeling OK now? Yeah, not too bad. No bits missing? No. It's all there. <laughs> sure about that. Yeah. <laughs> you must have felt pretty sick, though, um, sitting back at base, knowing that you'd left yeah. your team members to slog it round alone. Yeah, it was. I thought at the time I thought uh, carry on and do it. But when I got up in the morning, I knew I was going to be up and make it round. Yeah. What was going through your head, though? Pain. Pain. Apart <laughs> from pain. <laughs> and which is the best regiment in the world? Scots Guards. <laughs> I was just getting worried because you hadn't said it for about five minutes. Anyway, <laughs> congratulations, all of you. We've been impressed. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. I know that you went up in a helicopter, and I know that it took you around the final route march that you had to do. Did it look as long when you were up in the air as when you were actually doing it? Yeah. It did. Oh, yes. Yeah. It took us about half an hour to fly it. <laughs> in fact, it didn't get all the way around because I ran out of fuel. <laughs> anyway, congratulations and worthy winners. So that's the end of Combat 89. It's given us a fascinating insight into army life. Very impressive. Yes, very impressive. And we've met some super characters. The thing that has impressed me more than anything else, Annika, is the camaraderie amongst the teams. When a person or a team has been in trouble, they've really closed ranks. Sheer professionalism. Well, we look forward to seeing you for Combat 90. So it's goodbye to the Royal Regiment of Wales. The Light Infantry. The Queen's Regiment. The Royal Irish Rangers. The Gurkhas. King's own Scottish borderers. The Scots Guards. And the winners of combat, the Parachute Regiment.